Today we're concluding our sermon series on everyday spaces, spaces where we find ourselves living, working, learning, playing, and gathering. Uh, The spaces where we're all about living our life on mission, uh, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and sharing our faith. And the goal of this series was to raise all of our visions to see that the possibilities are endless of how to transform someone else's life in the name of Jesus. We saw in Matthew 28 how Jesus gives us great commission to go, to go and make disciples, and that he is with us always, that we're not alone in this endeavor, and that he calls us to love each other, especially loving the people that we just can't stand, and giving us this great commandment to love others as we love ourselves. And this going back all the way to Genesis 12 of how we have been blessed to be a blessing to others. And, and how that very ancient promise to Abram applies to us today because we've been blessed by Jesus Christ and his suffering and death and resurrection so that we might bless and extend his grace to others. And then last week we double-clicked on what it means to bless someone else in a very tangible, real way in our everyday lives, in our everyday spaces. And so today what we want to look at is as we gather, how do we move in those conversations from just a casual conversation we're having to someone to a meaningful conversation to having a spiritual conversation? So as we're blessing others, how do we take the conversations that we have and make them meaningful and full of impact so that we can introduce Jesus in a very natural way to someone else? And to set this up, I want you to imagine that you're exercising. Right, that you're, that you're sweating and you're giving it your all, which in this heat in Houston is easy to do. You just walk outside and you're instantly sweating. Not, not really a hard thing to do. And there's a group of people around you, right? You're doing this workout. For me, it's a group of bicyclists in a pack in a, in a no-drop group. And you're working out and you finish up and uh, you're getting everything going and uh, you get a Gatorade, right? You open it up. And the other person, they have a Gatorade too, they open it up. And the other person that finished their workout with you, um, they finish at the same time, but they're a little different. They're a little strange, a little odd. They're not normal like you are. And, and you're drinking your Gatorade, and they look at you and they say, hey, can I have a drink of that? How would you respond? If you're like me, you'd be like, yeah, go ahead and chug it. You can have the whole thing. You can keep it. Don't give it back. I don't need it at all. I'll, I'll be just fine. But what if the roles were reversed, right? What if they had a drink and they hand it to you and they ask you, do you want a drink? How many of you in that moment, it's decision time, how many of you would say, yeah, I'll take a drink of that. That'll be fine. A um, couple of you, all right, brave souls. How many of you would say, no, I'm fine, I'm good, you keep it for yourself, and I'm, I'm all right, all right, a few others. Many of you aren't answering because you're thinking I'm baiting you and trapping you into asking this question, and you're like, I don't want to know what this answer is, what's Pastor Randy up to? Well, if you found that kind of disgusting and weird and gross, that is the story for today. That's our gospel lesson. We're going to be looking at two people that should not be drinking each other's water jug. Uh, Two people that shouldn't even be talking to each other. Two people, two groups of people especially who hated each other and couldn't stand each other. So I want to invite you to open up to John chapter 4. And in John chapter 4, we're going to see a couple of conversations unfold. And if you're using the Bible in the pew ahead of you or electronically, however you read scripture, look with me in John chapter 4. And we won't have time to cover this entire story. This conversation is the longest conversation that Jesus has with someone else. But it's very profound and it is very impactful. Now to set this conversation up, Jesus is traveling in his ministry. He's going from south to north. Um, So he's going from south to north, and and the Jews all live in the north and all live in the south. And in between is a land called Samaria. And Jesus and a lot of Jews regularly traveled. They traveled from the south to the north, and again from the north to the south. In the north was was Jesus' home. uh, That's his home base. Uh, That's where he did all of his... um, ministry and his headquarters out of. And in the south is where the capital is, in Jerusalem. And there were festivals and feasts and celebrations in Jerusalem. So Jesus and his disciples would regularly travel from the north to the south and from the south to the north. 
But if you were a Jew like Jesus was, you would avoid that land in between. You would completely avoid Samaria. You would do an end route all the way around Samaria. You wouldn't even walk through it. It'd be like us here in Houston traveling to Dallas and avoiding Houston altogether, the downtown area. And I got to thinking about what group of people would we really dislike? What group of people would we want to just do an end run around? Because traveling around to get to Dallas would mean that you would have to go to Angleton, Wharton, Sealy, Hempstead, Magnolia, and Conroe, and then continue north, completely out of your way. And the only group of people I could come up with is probably the Houston Astros. So we really dislike them. I mean, you know, just it's, it's an illustration, so go with me. But you don't like the Astros, especially the past couple of games. You're like, I'm going to do an end run all the way around downtown Houston to get to Dallas because I really am fed up with them. Right? That level of dis, that the level of dislike, that's what it's like. It's even worse between the Jews and the Samaritans. They do an end run around Samaria. But Jesus doesn't take the bypass. He says to his disciples, we're going to take the Samaritan Express and we're going to go right through the middle of Samaria. And instantly the disciples are like, whoa, what's going on, Jesus? That, that's not in our GPS. That's not what we do. And Jesus is going to coach them and disciple them in what it means to change other people's lives. And so while they're in Samaria, there's going to be three conversations that are going to take place. I'm going to quickly walk through each of these conversations. But these conversations, we're going to see how they go from casual conversations to a meaningful conversation to a spiritual conversation and how that can help us as we're talking in our everyday lives, wherever we gather, to other people about our faith and most importantly, about who Jesus is. So the first conversation is between Jesus and a woman in Samaria. If you look with me in John chapter 4, starting with verse 5. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, weary as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So Jesus here, he's been traveling, he's tired, he's hungry, he's worn out, and he's thirsty. So he sends the disciples ahead to go get some lunch. And the time of day, it says the sixth hour, to translate that, that's 12 o'clock. That's the heat of the day. And we can relate. Like when we walk our dog, we don't do that at 12, 1, 2 o'clock. We do that early in the morning or late at night. Or if you're going to water your lawn, you're going to water it early in the morning or late at night. You're not going to water it at 12 in the heat of the day. And so it would be very, very strange for anyone to gather at this well at this time of day at 12 o'clock. But that's what Jesus is doing. And in verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, this scene is just stunning. Just to emphasize this, John says the Jews and the Samaritans, they don't mix well together. Yet Jesus deals with the Samaritan to prove a point. Jesus sees not this label of a Samaritan, but sees someone who's hurting, someone who needs eternal life. And he reaches out and says, I'd like to have a drink. Can you give me a drink of water? And the woman is shocked. Who are you to ask me? We're not supposed to be talking at all. We don't relate. And Jesus answers her in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So this turns into a very meaningful conversation. Jesus talks about the gift of God. It's so refreshing. It's a gift. He's talking about eternal life that that can't be earned. It's not deserved. It's a free gift that's given. And all we need to do is receive. And Jesus uses water as a metaphor for eternal life here. For anything that she's looking to sustain herself, Jesus is making this bold claim that the water he brings will sustain her and will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life in her heart. And this truth, this invitation is so compelling. The woman replies to Jesus, Give me this water. I'd like to learn more about this water. And Jesus masterfully goes from a casual conversation to a spiritual conversation. 
He uses physical thirst as a springboard to talk about her spiritual thirst. And here's how Jesus responds in verse 16. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you said is very true. Jesus calls her out, speaks truth in her life, and is gracious and kind about it. He keeps the conversation going. He's not repulsed. He's not judging her. He's just speaking truth and noticing what he sees. Jesus knows that she's filling her heart with things that aren't lasting, that leaves her empty every single time in the relationships that she's looking for. She's filling this void in her life with relationships and would go from one man to the next, and it's calling out for every single one of us What are we looking to, to fill that void in our heart? What is driving us? Is it hard work? Is it relationships? Is it looks? Is it being right all the time? Is it proving yourself? Or or making sure that you have everything that this world says you have to have in order to be successful? What are we filling our hearts with that we think are satisfying, but in the end leave us thirsty for Jesus? And when we fast forward the conversation, they talk about worship and have a little debate about that. And then the conversation lands in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This woman is ultimately looking for a savior. And Jesus points to him and says, I'm right here. I'm right in front of you. I'm the one offering you eternal life. And and he's just masterful. Jesus goes from water out of a well to a spiritual conversation about eternal life. And, And it raises the question for you and I, we're obviously not Jesus, but how do we have a natural, normal conversation about Jesus, just like we would have about cars or our work or sports or movies or TV show we're watching? How do we talk to other people in our everyday spaces when we gather together and talk about Jesus in a very natural way? Well, we have some help. We don't have to guess at how to go about that. Uh, there's a research group called Barna, and they did a study in December of 2022 answering this very question. And they asked people who were teens and adults that identified as no faith, Jesus isn't on their radar, this survey, this research group asked them this question. Imagine a Christian you'd be interested in learning from. Which of the following characteristics would you use to describe them? So again, these are people of no faith, Jesus isn't on their radar. If they were going to talk to you or I and be interested in what we had to say, What kind of posture would we have? What kind of attitudes would we exhibit? And this is what they said. They would listen without judgment. They would be honest about their doubts. They wouldn't force a conclusion. They would care about me as a person. They would be interested in me even if I'm not a Christian. They would understand me. They would have experienced struggles of their own. They're aware of the inconsistencies in their own perspective. Now, as you hear that, the challenge to you is, which one of those do you need to grow in? Because the world is telling us when we take this posture, we're going to build a relationship. And we're going to be able to build a relationship and build trust so that we have the permission to share who Jesus is and the difference he makes in our life and the difference it can make in their lives as well. Which leads us to the second conversation when the disciples return with lunch for Jesus. Look with me in verse 27. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. So this second conversation with the 12 disciples, it starts with them scratching their heads saying, what is Jesus doing talking to this woman, this Samaritan woman? And the woman leaves and goes into town and Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. Now what's really interesting when Pastor Dan and I were talking about this passage, he brings out something really, really profound. Pastor Dan noticed that this woman wasn't told to go into the town. It wasn't like Jesus said, hey, go into all the neighborhoods of Sychar and make disciples. Jesus never says that. 
She just instantly takes the initiative and has this good news that she wants to share. And look at her testimony. She says, see a man who told me all that I ever did. He understands me. He knows me. He wasn't repulsed by me. He wasn't ashamed of me. He wanted to help me. And the town responds by going to Jesus. And it's amazing. Everyone knows her reputation. Why should they even believe her? But there's something in her eyes. There's something in her testimony that says, this is true life. This is meaningful. This gives purpose. This gives eternal life. And as the town comes out to meet Jesus and get to know who he is, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. And look at verse 35. He says to his disciples, Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Jesus doesn't quote scripture. He uses an everyday phrase that they would say. They would say, hey, four more months and it's harvest. It's kind of like our TGIF. Six more days and it's Friday. I can't wait. Jesus says, don't you guys say that? You're preparing to celebrate something. And Jesus goes to the disciples, you're going to see a harvest that you didn't work for. You're going to see something that you didn't plant, but you get to celebrate. He looks at the disciples to say, you get to see the joy of someone else's work. Which leads me to ask, what if it's possible to take all the pressure off you? What if you could just take all the pressure off of having a conversation about Jesus with someone else? What if it wasn't all on you? What if God was at work in that person's life before you even had the conversation with them? What if God is at work well after you've had a conversation with them and built that relationship and they move out of the area and you're so disappointed that you can't share your faith? What if instead of freezing and overthinking that you're going to blow it, you're going to mess this whole Jesus deal up, what if you could just naturally say what's on your heart in a winsome way? What if all the pressure would just be lifted from you and you could overcome your fear of, man, if I say something wrong, it could mess it all up. What if you could be freed from all that? What if someone else is planting those seeds of eternal life in someone else? The grandma who's praying day after day for the grandchild. The boss who sends encouraging notes to the coworker that you're talking to. Or they attended an Easter service a bazillion years ago and it left them changed but they're not sure what to do with it. And years later they're having a conversation with you and something sparks inside them. One person plants and another harvests. We're not alone in this. And it's incredibly freeing. It doesn't give us permission to be a jerk and just talk about Jesus in an offensive way, but it just gives us the freedom to say, you know what, as the Spirit opens the doors, I'm going to walk through and see how the conversation goes and build the relationship and earn their trust. And then the third conversation in this passage, in verse 39, fast forward. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. The entire town believes, not just because of the woman's testimony, but because they encountered Jesus firsthand. And he says to the disciples, You didn't work at all for this, but you get to enjoy the fruit of someone else's labor. And he spends two days in that area, two days in an area that he should have quickly ran through. And it's a point to the disciples and it's a point to you and I not to rush through life, not to look at people as obstacles in our way of trying to get things done, but to see people as gifts of God, to see people that as we gather around, that that's a life that needs Jesus. And if they don't have Jesus, that we're planted there to speak his name, to be a witness for him, to share with them, hey, I know you're struggling. I know you're reaching for something that isn't lasting. I want to introduce you to Jesus. Let me tell you more about him. It reminds me of a story of Jesus, of what he said and what he did, especially in John chapter 4. Spiritual conversations are everywhere. We just need to have our eyes opened and pray to the Spirit to give us courage to boldly share our faith. I compare it to like when you, when you buy a vehicle, whether it's a car, an SUV, truck, whatever it is. After you buy that vehicle, what do you notice? You notice your vehicle everywhere on the road, right? 
you see it, you look, oh, wow, that's a different color, but I see the car that I'm driving, right? You've got this natural bias to notice the things that you have. Now, did everyone buy that same car on the same day you bought the car and instantly flooded the market with whatever it is that you bought? No. It just means your eyes are open to see the, wow, there is someone else who has the same car that I do. That's the same perspective Jesus gives us whenever we have a conversation with someone else. A conversation is always more than just sports or TV or whatever's happening in our life. It's about what Jesus is doing in and through us to make an eternal difference when someone else is planted and someone else harvests. May God give you that courage. May he give you the boldness to share your faith in a winsome way, to build that relationship with others that God has placed around you that you may proclaim his name and share his love and his grace, just like in John chapter 4, of changing their lives to see the meaning and purpose that Jesus can give. In Jesus' name, amen.